Welcome to Bangalore. It's a city of traffic, the youth, and endless opportunities. So when, during a college project, we were to explore the city's colonial heritage, we could not be happier. While searching for colonial architectures across Bangalore and hoping to find the answers to our questions, we came across the Bangalore State Central Library. Armed with a tripod and a dream, we set out to film and understand the colonial heritage of Bangalore through the eyes of an architectural marvel. We are about to explore what is arguably one of the most important remnants of Bangalore's colonial heritage. What you are looking at right now is the Sishadri Ayyar Memorial Hall, also known as the Bangalore State Central Library, a landmark building located in the heart of Bangalore. Completed in 1908, the structure was in the memory of Sir K. Sishadri Ayyar, who is widely regarded as the maker of the modern Bangalore and was funded by donations from the public along with a generous donation from the then Maharaja of Mysore. The idea was for the memorial hall to be used for a public purpose, specifically as a library. But it has a very curious early history. From about 1908, even before the building was completed, some of the rooms in the hall were rented out to a Bangalore club, not to be confused with today's Bangalore club among whose members were H. V. Nanjundaya and Sir M. Visveshwaraya, among other grandees. It was only in 1914 that the public library finally moved in here too. Located at the end of Cubbon Park, the library stands amidst a picturesque garden within a walking distance from the Vidhan Sadha and the Karnataka High Court. It has a statue of K. Sishadri Ayer surrounded by a rose garden. The library originally housed 4,750 books, but the current figure stands at an astounding 3 lakh books and 300 periodicals. It has a proficient braille collection and is open to the public from 8.30 am to 7 pm on all days except on Mondays. What is interesting about that, and, and I know that, that it stems from a, a, a form of common sense. It stems from where is water available, where do we have vantage points, where do we not have flooding situations and all of that. But at another level, it's also enabling us a reading of how you want to position yourself and your institutions apart from the rest of the city. And that's interesting because I guess all of us in that position might want to do that if you, if you thought like that, you know. So, so I think that is the first um, aspect that is worth noting, that there are positional differences which are also strategic. The second would be in terms of the form of the architecture itself, because the British very often uh, would use common motives. One was to be able to identify with the people. And I think in that sense, Bangalore has had a very easy, not such a harsh colonial uh, you know, sort of negotiation. It's been kind of easy. Bangalore's intelligentsia were, uh, were dining with them and, you know, they... Uh, in fact, the library itself is a case in point that it was built in honor of uh, Sri Shadri Ayer, you know, which is fascinating. So, Bangalore's had that little bit of an easy relationship, unlike other parts of the country, you know, which were really engaged with freedom struggle. And here it, it ended up being more cultural, you know, it ended up being creating infrastructure, which was public infrastructure. Yes, there might have been, I'm sure there was. Um, uh, sort of the biases that go with, uh, with with its time. But it still has left us a legacy that we can actually bank on, which is interesting. Um, in terms of the architecture itself, I would say that it pretty much follows the Indo-Saracenic pattern that they alluded to in order to be able to establish um, identity within a new context. The library was a visually stunning masterpiece. Although we were denied filming rights several times, to witness the library in all its glory with the late afternoon sun filtering in through the windows and the gorgeous videos made the three trips worth it. A beautiful red dome nestled in the middle of a rose garden with sprinklers on in the afternoon heat, sending the air with wet earth. The building features pointed arches and other western design elements mixed in with the Indian architectural features such as the traditional khajja. 
The entryway is a huge room where we had to turn in our bags. Double doors led into the library and another entryway gives access to the side room with ornate wooden stairways. The side room led into the braille and compatible exam preparation areas and on the third floor, accessible through the staircase, was the newspapers, journals and periodical section. It, in our humble opinion, was the most beautiful part of the library, with newspapers littered across tables, sunlight filtering in, all while offering a bird's eye view of the central part of the library. The library was a huge room, laid out in two symmetrical shapes, with the front area reserved for tables. Nestled between the books were computers for research purposes and a transparent staircase that allowed access to the second level of books. Leading out from that were two rooms, one being an office for employees and the other leading into a section about English and Hindi books. The same corridor held a Xerox room and on the second floor was a storage area. It was a magnificent structure with ornamental arches and a massive fall ceiling. And the librarian's table sat in the center of it all. So, um, Victorian, as you read, was a set of eclectic styles, you know, which kind of commonly began, began to be called Victorian uh, later in the day. But one then could say, technically, that, that when the British built, they were also being eclectic in the colonies that they established and in the sort of the outposts that they established. So I think all of what we're seeing as termed colonial is essentially eclectic. So, sir, when the memorial hall was built, it held around 4,750 books. Now it has 3 lakh books and more than 300 periodicals. So, uh, back then in, the Victor in, the, in colonial India, education was a very important topic of discussion. I want to know your views on that. And in continuity of that, there was a lot of censorship around what books were available to the public and how they were also used as a source of power and control. So, what are your, your opinions on that, on the education system and access to books? Well, uh, I think this is a very interesting question. Uh, I myself, as a history enthusiast, used to visit some of the libraries, including Delhi, Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. There also you have a separate, uh, specific uh, section, uh, prohibited books or banned literature. As you, you also, when you do research, maybe you can think of visiting banned literature or prohibited. So this also clearly tells us, uh, you know, the kind of knowledge they want to create. And those literature which wanted uh, anti-British sentiments or maybe indigenous ways of uh, exploring ideas or being critical about the modern scientific uh, ideas, these uh, books were prohibited so that the modern civilizing mission, the British missionary education or English education can be disseminated. So this clearly tells how the British were desperately trying to fulfill their political agenda. It is nothing to do with inculcating the knowledge, the spirit of knowledge among the people. This is a clear indication of how the British were you know, trying to at least use education um, as a very powerful instrument of civilizing mission. So, colonial forms of knowledge. So that's a very important book, Bernard S. Cohen, the British uh, historian who has uh, clearly uh, dealt with this, uh, you know, dangers of uh, using or rejecting some uh, aspects of Indian knowledge system was intended to create and segregate the people so that they would be able to get the uh, in a claim that they are the actual and real knowledge providers where indigenous knowledge system has uh, nothing to do with uh, you know the holistic development of the people yes so as you must have observed during the documentary we do not establish any arguments instead offering you multiple post-colonial perspectives to construct your own we explain to you the power politics in play and their historical and contemporary relevance, which are backed by our interviews. We explain the Victorian zeitgeist of imperial expansion, cultural superiority, and the colonial civilizing mission as is channelized through the architecture and the education. This documentary was an almost painful process, filming and walking in the sun to get the best lighting, followed by hours upon hours of back-breaking scripting, research and editing, 
all to ensure an end product that could exemplify our passion to deliver an excellent end product that would represent and the respect we feel for our artifact in hopes of doing it justice i think i think one rues the loss of um the cognition of history made available to us and i think that's where um maps documents documentaries like yours would be important to sort of just revive a little curiosity you know to be able to really look at uh infrastructure as it has existed from the beginning of